Welcome to the conversation on the TYT network. Um, I've got a warning for you guys. We might be about to have a very interesting conversation. Uh, we're bringing on retired Lieutenant Colonel Sargis Singari. Uh, and he is the CEO of Near East Center for Strategic Engagement. What that is is interesting, uh, let alone the conversation we're about to have. Uh, Lieutenant Colonel, welcome to the show. It's good to be here, guys. All right. So. Uh, before I get into what, what your company does, which I find to be fascinating, um, I wanted to ask you about Afghanistan. Um, do you disagree with the withdrawal? <laughs> well, who would agree with how it was done? Uh, I know we were eventually gonna leave, everybody knew that. Rumsfeld knew that eventually we were gonna leave Afghanistan in uh, November of uh, 2001. But you have to set the process by which you're gonna be able to withdraw. And I think it was absolutely a debacle. And uh, we still have Americans left behind, which me and some of my friends are working to try to get out of Afghanistan. Okay. so. Uh, it was not executed well for sure, uh, but you said even Rumsfeld thought we should leave at some point, of course. And yet here we are 20 years later. Uh, so was 20 years enough or did you think we should have stayed longer? Oh, you gotta defeat the enemy. This enemy has been on the battlefield for 1400 years and uh, you have to get into their psyche and defeat them. Unfortunately, number of times through many administrations, we took the eye off the ball. I think the previous POTUS set the stage when he squeezed Iran, but left Port of Charbahar open I, even after the sanctions, which uh, got the Indians to be able to develop that port for the Iranians, push our rail into Afghanistan, forcing the Pakistan, uh, squeezing him financially. And when they turned towards Saudi Arabia, Saudi Arabia was being squeezed by the POTUS too, the previous one, where they were not gonna be funding any support for Pakistan, support of their uh, intelligence services to be able to fund the Taliban. So that really kind of pushed the Taliban to have to come to negotiation tables on American terms. But unfortunately after that, when every, once everything was turned over, the decision to withdraw was just um, a disaster. Yeah, no, uh, we, we do not agree on that. Uh, so, but I, I'm curious, you said this enemy has been on the battlefield for 1400 years. Uh, does that mean we have to stay there for another 1400 years? And what do you mean this enemy? Oh, you got to defeat them. Uh, what you How? might call Who? out. Uh, look, uh, when we fought against the Germans, um, uh, you know, I was asked this question by my commander one time, and he said, you know, there were some good Germans uh, in Germany. I said, yes, sir, but they were, you know, supporting a fascist Nazi. We had to drop bombs, even burn major, uh, you know, German cities in order to be able to even sometimes kill those good Germans. Why? Because at the end of the day, they burned the Jews into ovens, into a crisp. You cannot allow that mentality to operate wherever it manifests itself, you get attacked. attack it. In this case, we should have just absolutely wiped out the Taliban, did not give them an opportunity to breathe. We had an 18 hour window under the current Biden administration. When they were initially attacking us and we were departing, which is part of their SOP, we could have probably wiped out their strategic leadership that was on the battlefield, exposing themselves, their operational and tactical folks. We could have blocked their uh, you know, retreat, and we could have probably done it in 18 hours. Unfortunately, that decision was made not to. I think the issue is that just like when we dropped two nuclear bombs on Japan to bring him to the table on our terms, we never ever approached this enemy in that fashion. We constantly give him opportunities problem. to recover. The Correct. problem was that we did not nuke them. No, not nuke them. We did not attack him to destroy their leadership. Taliban was wiped out almost under the Bush administration. No, 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 Bush wait, 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 Iraq. wait, 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 wait. I want to be clear, okay? So because you're a retired lieutenant colonel in the United States yes. military. So you, you didn't just say leadership, you used the model in Germany and Japan where we incinerated their citizens, their civilians. For example, in Tokyo, we murdered 500,000 civilians even before the nuclear weapons were used, we firebombed them. Robert McNamara said, if we lose the war, we'll of course be tried as war criminals. So you seem to hold that up as exemplary. Is that what you thought we should have done in Afghanistan? No, what I'm saying is you had an enemy who was not gonna quit, but you brought him to heal. You never brought this enemy to heal. You put him in Guantanamo, you gave him lawyers, and then you released him under a sale. The, that, of, the uh, Taliban, back to the, 
The first you, one, you I, I just want to be clear. In Guantanamo, half the people were turned in by the Taliban and were enemies of the Taliban. They were mistakenly turned in. And so we kept a bunch of people who were perfectly innocent in Guantanamo as well. So it's, it's, I just uh, look, want to be clear uh, about the facts. You're looking, you're looking at everything from, a, from that perspective of a Westerner. To you, they're innocent. To them, they're nothing more than individuals who work with the Taliban. Uh, look, uh, this. But a lot of them didn't. Enemy. A lot of them worked against the Taliban. A lot of them were, were Uyghur no, look, Turks from China. It, they had nothing to do with the, case, the Taliban. If that's the case, the Iranians gave us uh, gave us targeting to hit Taliban targets. Okay, so look, as Mark Snicks, however you want to approach it, uh, does that mean that we should have kept our deal with the Iranians because they gave us targeting for the uh, for the Taliban themselves? Yes. The Turks right now are supporting the Taliban. They're part of NATO. Uh, support structures. The Turks have an interest in what is happening currently in Afghanistan. Look, uh, you're getting to a point where these individuals kill each other on a daily basis. You have the Shia who kills a Sunni and says, you're an infidel, I'm gonna kill you. The same thing, vice versa. Now, if you take anybody else to include an American or Christians or other minorities, Hindus, and you put them between this particular enemy, you're gonna lose. The only way you could bring this enemy to heel, he has to understand that he is gonna get wiped out if he takes any steps outside of what the norms of extended societies are. And okay. in this case, if you give them a political process for them to recover themselves, they will always manifest themselves. Look, this enemy has attacked you in the United States, and Europe has attacked. They were you even manifesting saying, look, in I gotta Japan. Cut you. Hold on, hold on. So there's a bunch of problems here. You keep saying bring the Taliban to heal, but you started this conversation with burning their civilians alive. I don't see how that would bring the Taliban oh, to heal. Yeah, uh, I didn't say burn their civilians alive. Well, that's the uh, analogy you, you use with the nuclear well, that, weapons like, and the and the German example and the firebombing of the cities that burned their civilians alive. So why did you bring up that example then? Because on a technical basis, that's what we had and that's what we did. We squeezed that individual to heal. Now you're talking about modern weapon technologies. You can reach out and touch this person any place you want. You don't need to have any type of a governmental ambassador citizen. So Lieutenant Colonel, what the hell were we doing in Afghanistan all this time? You guys droned the living crap out of Afghanistan. You hit him and hit him and bombed him and bombed him and did the occupation for 20 straight years. Then don't you have to admit that you were totally and grossly incompetent? That you guys had 20 years and couldn't do a goddamn thing, both the military and private contractors like yourself. Well, I think where you're getting to is the issue we've had because we never approach this enemy from an ideological standpoint. We only approach him on how we can attack him, correct? And I think that's probably what you're getting the sense of. But no, if you think about it from the strategic perspective, I used to have units would come through my training and I would say, okay, what are you gonna do now? Here's an enemy in Afghanistan manifesting themselves in this particular position. So the commander would say, well, I'm gonna employ my force structures here. I'm gonna have my multi structure here. I'm gonna bring my SF assets here. I'm gonna bomb him here. I'm gonna destroy him here. I'm gonna block him here. But when you think about that, I would say, okay, what did you accomplish at the end? He said, well, I destroyed the enemy. I said, yeah, but what did you accomplish? Why did you fight this war? And a lot of them couldn't answer. Well, I was told to fight because he's an enemy. No, you have to fight him on an ideological perspective. We never fought this individual on an ideological perspective because we never defined who this person is. You have to have an end game to all wars. Why are you fighting an enemy in the Middle East? Why are you fighting him? Are you fighting because you have no interest? We have an interest. One individual burns themselves in, uh, in uh, Tunis and the entire Middle East goes up in flames. And then it reaches out and touches you in uh, California. It touches you other places, the homeland US. So, so you have to understand Colonel. that you have to have an ideological reason to fight this enemy. You, what you is that? That's a decision that Americans haven't made yet. So you, you started with firebombing their citizens, and now you're talking about an ideological battle. And now I'm a little worried about asking what I'm gonna ask. Okay, so you, you mentioned earlier that I'm looking at it from an American perspective, and then you said these individuals have been killing each other for all this time. But they're different individuals. There's Sunni, there's Shia, there's Persian, there's Arab, there's Turkic, on and on. So then now you talk about an ideological battle. So this is so now I'm afraid to ask, what do you mean by an ideological battle and who is them? The ideological battle that says that regardless if you do not believe in my dictates of my religious philosophy, you have to die. 
like I said, Shia do it to the Sunnis, Sunni to the Shia, Al Qaeda does it to ISIS, ISIS does it to Taliban, regardless. But they're all doing it for one reason, establishment of a caliphate. The Middle East, since Muhammad to Ottoman Empire, had a caliphate in charge of it. They were very brutal to their citizens. And they killed their citizens who did not listen to their dictates. It was a religious and secular so-called combination of leader that was leading the entire caliphate. Once this divided during the British and French signing of the Sykes-Picot contract, which was a contract, and these so-called states were manufactured in the Middle East. These so-called leaders that were supposed to be secular, separate from their Islamic backgrounds, ended up not being able to control it. Why? Because when it came to the people, they could not really justify their positions. How do you justify your position if you're a king or a somebody who is in a prince position? You justify it by saying, I am placed in here because of godly support. Well, when you had a separation of these particular divides of the religion and the also the secular, the only way, whether it was a Shah of Iran, Saddam Hussein, or anybody else that was out there that was a dictator, when they realized that they're losing their base, what did they turn to? They turned to Islam, whether it be Saddam Hussein placing uh, Allahu Akbar uh, on his uh, flag or the Shah in an interview demeaning his own wife because he had to placate to the Islamic dictates where the men are more superior than the women in the interview that was done even on ABC in the US. This is the problem you run into. As the Persian businessmen used to get up in the morning, eat in their houses, fly out to France, spend money as they wanted to, shop, and then fly back after you know, late dinner and sleep in their own beds. These same individuals turned around because of an ideology and said, you know what? We are going to support an Islamic Republic that is now established in the region that has been base for terror for a number yeah. of years. Okay, so the this is a problem. We never understood that this thing though is not going to change unless okay. you really L approach from the Middle Eastern Lute perspective. Yeah. So the combination of both. Lieutenant Colonel uh, Singer, you're saying uh, very dangerous things. Uh, you're lumping all Muslims together and and you seem to be generalizing that Muslims are the problem. And, and then you say you're only specific a political point that you made that other than a general honestly bigoted attack against all Muslims all across the world was, hey, they're combining church and state. Okay, I'm worried about, it. I'm secular, I'm worried about combining church and state. But clearly, that's what they're doing in Texas by taking away abortion rights. So should we firebomb the citizens of Texas according to your ideology? No, listen, you could read whatever you want into it. I think if you go to the tape, I pretty much laid it out. This ideology works in hand in hand. I have my own mother here who's a Christian who went ahead and opened up a, a just a safety deposit box in a local bank years ago with my dad. Uh, now my dad passed away two years ago as of this September 14. When we went, when she went to close it out, the bank leadership, who's not believe, you know, following Sharia law, said you can't close it out. She said, I don't believe in your religious beliefs. I am a Christian woman. So it doesn't matter. It has to be a man to be able to close it out. Okay, I get it. The you ideology that he it. pushes. No, look, I love that Mike's about. I've actually fought and bled for those individuals on the battlefield. So I don't want to hear from you if you haven't been on the battlefield of Iraq and Afghanistan fighting to save these individuals. Save okay, them, so I know you gotta save their village not. by burning it down. Here, I, I, I promise this, so I gotta ask you about your company. You you guys said you're a military advisory group for the Assyrian army in Iraq. I, this is a genuine question, I, I and it's not ideological, I'm curious. How does a, a private contractor contract with a non-government entity and then get into the middle of a battle and help them militarily, is, is, is that legal in, in American law, international law? And can anyone do it? Can a, a number of people just go to one side or another and start teaching them how to kill better? No, you can't do that. Look, we support the Assyrian Christians because they're getting butchered in bushels between 2014 and 2017. Uh, so when we got on the battlefield, there are multiple different companies out there that were operating. Uh, we did it in a way of an advisory to them. Uh, yes, we did operations at the tier one, tier two level. 
uh, and they had no support. We couldn't even get uh, a request for our bombing runs against uh, targets in Syria because uh, the Obama administration at that time did not want to even attack uh, oil convoys ever coming through because it might be an environmental hazard. Uh, so uh, the way we did it was we raised money, we supported the uh, families of those uh, soldiers who decided to go and fight uh, on the battlefield. And uh, we had a number of victories to where even at the uh, ISIS at that time declared the army that we had as a nuisance that had to be fought against when they declared war in their magazine against France. So look, um, I fought on the battlefields. I, I know this enemy. I, uh, I understand how he operates. It, uh, he operates in a uh, non-secular, uh, I should say, a non-conventional way. And you have to fight him on his battlefield the way he yeah. does. Uh, yeah, you've been doing that for 20 there. years. And how's that working out for you? Um, okay. Well, look, uh, look, it hasn't worked out well, right? Because we, yeah, because uh, you keep killing uh, your civilians, and then they hate you more, then they hate me more, and they hate all of us more, and it creates endless wars, which honestly is profitable for you, but is disastrous for the rest of us. Well, no, we haven't made any money. I haven't earned money from you. It's hard to turn on to a refugee and say, "Give me money, so I can save you." We did it out of our own pocket. I actually sold rugs in my own car to pay for some of the efforts we did because we wanted to make sure no money came to them. Uh, look, uh, when you're on the battlefield, you're the Syrian Christians. Every 1.5 million, the first time United States went to war against Iraq, we knew that the Christians would be butchered. Because if you can't no, reach out and kill an American here. No, that's not true. Yeah, when I we knew when, when when I was saying we shouldn't go to Iraq war, one of the main points I was making is I was worried the Christians were gonna get butchered. And the idiots like Bush and Cheney and Rumsfeld said, no, they'll be better off. How'd that work out? Well, when I say we, I should uh, say more about my friend who actually went and put himself on a cross for three days in front of the UN. Here's an Uber driver and he said Christianity in the Middle East ends today. And you know what? He was much smarter than most of the PhDs and the presidents. I you know why really he understood it. that? Because he knew that this enemy was gonna go ahead and kill those Christians. We went from 1.5 million to 100,000. Now, if they're so-called individuals who are not out there to kill, others for the ethnicity and for their religious beliefs, then that should not have happened, right? All right. They should have been protected. Yeah, Lieutenant Colonel, last question. So uh, are American mercenaries allowed to go and work for foreign governments or foreign entities, which are paramilitary groups within a civil war like Syria? Um, again, I'm just asking because I don't know, and it's a simple no, look, question. Uh, no, by, by law, by regulation, none of this should happen. But the problem is it's been so bad across the board and uh, the rules are what they are. Today you have Americans on the ground helping to get Americans out of Afghanistan. The State Department is not doing it. Uh, Department of Defense is not the lead for it. Uh, so it shouldn't happen, but it does happen. Uh, and unfortunately, uh, we've done it to ourselves because of the bureaucratic way we operate. Look, when I had the uh, commander of the Syrian forces, we went and sat in front of the State Department and said, look at the operations we did because we knew no support was gonna come to them because of our basically of Syrian Christians. What ends up happening, State Department said, why don't you guys go and join the Hashi Shabi uh, at that time so we can funnel money directly to what the state is supposed to do to the Iraqi government to you guys. We rejected that, said that makes no sense, other Christians did. But at the same time, two years later, the same State Department turned around and designated Hashi Shabi as a terror group. And when they started bombing the targets and joining them in Iraq, some Christians were wounded in those strikes. Why? Because they followed what the State Department told them to do in accordance with how we distributed functional budget, $150, and how we used foreign multi sales. Our systems are not designed to understand how to operate with these people. Unfortunately, oh, yeah. we rely on them so much that we don't really care what happens to the guy on the ground. You seem to show a lot of concern for Christian civilians that were killed when they shouldn't be. And I share that concern. You did not seem to share a similar concern about Muslim civilians being killed earlier in the interview. All right, retired Lieutenant Colonel Sergeant. No, look, uh, that's your opinion. I never stated that if I was. Yes, you I did. You said we should have brought them to heel by firebombing them, just like we did in Germany and Japan. You said that. No, I said we did that in Germany, we did that in Japan, and brought those two countries to the table. I said we never use our power in the Middle East to do so. You could go you back to the tape and listen to it. So, but <laughs> you're reading into the comment 
You're like, what else would I be reading into it? A, that's what we did. You said we you firebombed them and that brought them to heel, and that's what we should have done. I also said that the president put sanctions on Iran but kept a port open so India can work with Iran to put pressure on Taliban to bring him to the table. It is not as black and white. Maybe it's easier for, for this conversation for it to be, but I think I was pretty direct as far as showing the linkage as far as how you report it from the strategic perspective and how you have to have an information operation campaign ahead of your operation yeah. before you go in. War is brutal and you better be willing to kill people at times. That's why we shouldn't go into it willy nilly like you want us to for 1400 years. But we're very clear on that. You All don't right. need to go into it, it will come find you. Yeah, like you want to go find it for profit. That's and all of your why contractor it, buddies do, it, and the Defense Department does, and you all get rich off of it. You, you claim you're not making money. I, I don't believe you. Every defense contractor you, it wants to make money, wants returns. war, doesn't care about the civilians, wants to kill, 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 create more and endless wars. Why? Because endless wars create more wars. Because then they hate us because we kill their civilians, and then they come attack us, and then we go round and round and round. And by the way, in all of this, what's the one country that got treated like they were the top of the world, even though they're the ones who actually attacked us, Saudi Arabia. Why? Because of goddamn oil and money and the corrupt people that started all these wars that you love so much. Oh, you can say you, but I mean, go look at my tax and currents. I haven't made money off of any of these wars. Maybe you believe that because you make money based on your show. I don't make money based on anything. I know, else. poor defense contractors I, I have never made I any do money. Based oh, on do you also think Lockheed Martin doesn't make money and Raytheon doesn't make money and Halliburton and all they, these companies? They all do. What I'm they make billions off you, of wars, don't one, they? One thing I t you're right, and I'll tell you one thing. The, when I went uh, at the religious broadcasters gathering because we were briefing about what's happening about uh, certain Christians, there were two meetings at that time. One was a briefing as to what is happening on the ground. Another one was a meeting that was talking about how you could raise money for your churches, maybe for your programs. And I don't know in this case if you've ever been there. Uh, most people were in the uh, program as that, so how to make money. Look, five years ago this November, I stood on stage uh, at a synagogue in, uh, in Canada. And I said, look, why is it that even the East, uh, that the Western churches are not doing anything about the genocide of we also are presented the Yazidis, okay, in this process. And basically, because they don't understand this evil, they don't understand the nature of the evil because they never faced it. When this evil kills you and manifests in front of you, that's the only time you may get a taste of it. I've seen how it operates. No, now, with that no, said, no. I have. You keep calling it evil, Lieutenant operates. Colonel. And so. If you're talking about fundamentalists of any religion, Muslims, Christians, Jews, you name it, by the way, Buddhists, Hindus, then I'm dead set against it and and I'm secular and I wanna fight an ideological, rhetorical, political a battle of ideas. Okay, I'm in favor of that. I'm not in favor of killing their civilians. I'm not in favor of lumping them all together. I'm not in favor of invading their countries based on their religion. This, the rest of it is total insanity. There's a giant you difference between be. fundamentalist Islam. Yeah. And by the way, I left Islam, so I've had fundamentalist Muslims threaten to kill me. So I know a thing or two about that. But yeah, I do not equate that with 1.6 billion Muslims in the world, as you seem to do over and over and over again. Whenever you talk about them and how they've been in there for 1400 years and they are all the same, Shia, Sunni, etc. You seem to be equating evil with Muslims and it is very dangerous and that's actually what gets us killed. Yeah, I, uh, I ran for office here in 2020, got a 107,818 votes and I got uh, support you lost, based right? on what I said, even from Islamic organizations here. So they understand what they're dealing with, maybe you yes. don't. But uh, what I would tell you is, is a personal opinion, right? At the end of the day is how our policy executes. Do you believe that wars are gonna end because you don't get involved in the regions that are destabilized? If you believe that, God bless you. I how many wars do. has Indonesia been involved time. in in the Middle East? Say again? How many wars has Indonesia been involved in in the Middle East? None. You know why? Because they didn't no, start Indonesia, any. Yes. And how many times Indonesia, did they get attacked? Yeah. None. You know why? Because they didn't start yeah, they any don't. stupid wars in the Middle East, so you all could get rich, and so that the oil companies can get rich because of our goddamn corrupt politicians. If you don't, if you don't get involved in these wars, they don't start. They don't hate you forever, and they don't bomb you and kill your families. 
But instead, you, know, you guys got to, no, know, no, no, firebomb them, firebomb them. They're evil. You know, no, you know Lieutenant Colonel, if I'm being honest with you, if I'm being honest with you, there is one person that sounds evil. There is one person that sounds evil, the one saying kill their citizens because they're all the same and they're evil. That's the person that actually sounds evil. And I got news yeah, for you, it's you. Nobody says kill citizens, but when somebody has a gun in their hand and they're part of a- They didn't have a gun in their hand until we went over there them. and started fighting them nonstop. The Saudis had the gun, but you didn't go to the Saudis. You went to Afghanistan and yeah. you went to Iraq that had nothing to do with it. Why? Ah, they're all Muslims anyway, right? No, listen. Why the hell did we go Saudi to Iraq? Arabia has Iraq a didn't attack us on 9 11. Of dollars in Indonesia. You, you probably know that by now as far as how much money they invest. That money that moves through Indonesia and moves outside is used sometimes and even manifests through South Sudan. Why did we Sudan go to Iraq? Itself. Why did we go to Iraq? Why did we go to Iraq? Iraq did not, did not do 9 11. Why did we go but, to Iraq? Listen. I think you're right because the the idea was from what I Bush taught that if you go there, you might be able to squeeze the root, the strongest Sunni state, and maybe you'll be able to go ahead and make a change. Uh, unfortunately, they realized that that was not possible. You just so said look, it was because they were Sunni the, Muslim and had nothing look, to do with Al Qaeda at all. No, Al Qaeda was there. Al Qaeda was there. No, they the, weren't. The no, beginning. they weren't. That's just flat out false. Al Qaeda, Al -Qaeda is. Yeah, Al Qaeda hated I Saddam. Saddam hated Al Qaeda. Saddam killed Al Qaeda all the time, along with a lot of other innocent people. But Saddam he hated Al Qaeda. He killed who he had to for his own benefit, like everybody Why else. Why did does. we kill so and attack the country that hated Al Qaeda? Because they're you Muslim, you said it, because they're Sunni all Muslim. These movements, the, all these movements then, that's what you're telling me, that all these movements are based on dollars. They're driven like that. They're driven out of Saudi and Indonesia. If that money is coming from them directly to support them and it's well, coming okay, through it's, Then what do you uh, think UAE, they're motivated by? You think they're motivated by Islam, off. right? You think they're motivated by Islam? You've been saying it the whole interview, right? No, you have to have a motivation. What is your motivation then? What is no, your no, motivation? I'm interviewing you. You think it's Islam, it, right? No, it's an establishment of a caliphate. What is the caliphate, caliphate. based on? I just Saddam told you. Saddam didn't want to. Saddam just caliphate, wanted to establish you, his own dictatorship in however broad an area he could. He used religion as an excuse. It had nothing to do with a caliphate. You're using Islam as a way to attack all Muslim cultures and all Muslim countries. No, it's a, if that was the case, then Muslims would have uh, had the same idea that you have. There's a lot of Muslims out there who don't agree with you from Iraq to uh, Kurds that have fought against this type of a uh, enemy and they realize they cannot control it. The problem has been when you have anyone that you could dictate and say, the guy next to you, whether it be Shia, Sunni, whether it be Christian, is a person who doesn't belong to your ideology, you gotta go kill him. You can never- That's you what can you're never saying really throughout the interview. Them. You have to you're squeeze saying, them. You're saying we have to fight an ideological battle backed up by uh, massive bombs and burnings and killings. So what you're saying is no, if they don't agree that. with me, no, no, but that's a literal thing that you're saying you if they, have they have don't agree with my ideology, let's go kill them. How are you any different? No, that wasn't said. You could try to spin it that way, but that wasn't said. You Look, said it was an ideological is, battle and that you wanted to conduct that militarily. Right the discussion we're having right now, and most people will see as a ideological battle, if you want to call it, is fought right here between this headspace, right here, those six inches. This is where it's fought. So then let's do it you ideologically, it let's not do it militarily. So let me ask you, okay, then let me ask you a question. I'll put you on uh, on this particular question, you could wise us up because I don't know any better. How do you fight that ideology here to ensure that doesn't come out and kill innocent people? I do it it's every killing day. Him in, in, in Afghanistan, it's killing him in Iraq, it's killing him in Syria, uh, it's killing him in Yemen, it's killing him in Sudan and South Sudan, it's killing him in Kenya, no, no, you're killing it's him killing him in Salamia. Okay, How all right, it, we're done, but I'll answer your question and then we're done. Yeah. Um, there you go. So I do it every day, we've reached 20, 20 billion views, okay? And what we do is we explain to people why fundamentalist religion is wrong, no matter what that religion is. And how you cannot combine church and state. We explain and we fight for secular values, but we don't do it by killing people. We don't do it through military occupation that oppresses them and that makes them want to fight you more, not less. You don't convince them by killing their brothers and sisters and aunts and uncles and babies. 
You do it by actually trying to convince them. But you don't want to do that because when you have a hammer, everything looks like nails. So you see Muslims and you think, let's invade. And that's mental and it has led us to be a lot less safe. It is brutal, it's bigoted. and But the most important thing is, it doesn't work. 20 years, complete and utter failure doing it your way. Yeah, that, look, um, get them to understand how to kill each other for the past Here we uh, go again with years, them. Shia and Sunnis. Now, with that said though, when we went into Iraq, we made the Iraqi constitution and Islamic constitution. If you agree with what you're saying, that you should be first one telling all your viewers, contact your congressman and tell them to put pressure on Iraq to change their constitution from an Islamic constitution to a secular constitution. Same thing with Iran. Okay, I'll tell them that. And then see how much you're gonna get anything out of it. Okay. We establish an Islamic constitution with Islamic- So what do you wanna do, go, go back even, and invade Iraq again? Because they have an no, Islamic I, constitution? No, you have now individuals on the ground who don't believe in that ideology. You got us Syrians, you got Yazidis, they could have their own region. Of course, I don't you. want Iraq to have an Islamic constitution. It doesn't mean yeah. the answer is bombing them, we gotta go. All right. And here's what I would ask you, please go out and tell all your congressmen to, I mean, all your personnel to call their congressmen and tell them that the Assyrian Christians, just like everybody else has an ethnicity, if you don't want to consider their religion, deserve their region. We want it now, and I want to make yes, sure that you I, I yourself want write a letter. Absolutely. Hey, like look, we it. reached agreement at the end of uh, uh, this uh, uh, contentious, otherwise contentious interview. I believe Listen, that Iraq. I believe that Iraq. Hold on. I believe that Iraq should uh, separate church and state, and I think Texas should too. So I don't think any Christian country should do it. I don't think any Christian state should do it. I don't think any Jewish state should do it. I don't think any Muslim state should do it. I'm sure that you agree. I agree with that. And um, you know, look, thank you for having me on your show, and thank you for letting me, you know, come back, you know, and talk a little bit uh, over you on some of the discussions. You wouldn't, you didn't yeah. have to let me do that, but uh, I appreciate the fact that we had an opportunity to talk. I'm not saying I got all the answers, but uh, every now and then, as I told people. Put the scope in my chest, ask me the tough questions, because that's the only way we can improve our leadership. So thank you for the time. And again, please help us to get a region for those certain Christians as an ethnicity in Northern yeah. Iraq. Much okay. appreciated. All right, thank you. Thanks for watching The Young Turks, really appreciate it. Another way to show support is through YouTube memberships. You'll get to interact with us more. There's live chat emojis, badges. You've got emojis of me, Anna, John, JR. So those are super fun, but you also get Playback of our exclusive member only shows and specials right after they air. So all that, all you gotta do is click that join button right underneath the video. Thank you.